Well, good evening. All right. All right, so uh, about a month back, Mr. Nelson reached out to me. He uh, sent me a text and uh, he, he asked if I would speak. He sent a picture of the, of the bullets of what um, I would be talking about. And I agreed. Um, and, then I, and then I looked at the bullets and I saw the bullets and they, and they said, uh, faith, doctrine, what we believe, practice, how we worship, how we govern the church, Etc., and it, it kind of kind of seemed like everything. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start in Genesis one, chapter one. <laughs> Kidding. Um, so two weeks ago, um, Brother Abraham he spoke about the Bible and how it's the only divinely inspired, authentic, and authoritative uh, word of God. And in the bulletin, my section um, is kind of a continuation of that. Uh, and mine kind of goes over the, because the Bible is this, our lives and the church should follow uh, what the Bible says. Now, I want to quickly touch um, on the fact that we're going to mention that the Bible is the, the complete guide. Complete meaning it doesn't need anything to be added to it and nothing to be removed from it. Um, and we mentioned it's, it's seen in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. It says, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that were written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So last week at work, I was visiting another department. And while I was there, I happened to notice on their bookshelf, they had a book called the brand Bible. And um, I picked it up and I looked at the front cover of it and it said, the only brand book you'll ever need. And um, <clears throat> that concept also kind of com comes up at work a lot. Um, I work with the branding team at FIU, the marketing team. And we make these brand guides for different colleges um, at the university. And it's not unheard of to hear someone say, this brand guide is gonna be your Bible for the next couple of weeks while you're working on this project. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny and I thought it was, I was interesting that um, this, this idea and the word Bible in, in the world still, they see it as meaning it's complete. It's the only book you'd need. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and dive in and talk about a couple things. Uh, there's a lot that we can definitely touch on uh, and we, I was told 20 minutes, and I'm an absolute nervous wreck up here. So we're going to keep it short and sweet. Um, first, we'll take a look at some examples uh, in the scriptures, how we as believers should conduct ourselves. And then we'll touch on a few practices um, in the church. Now, again, if I were to comment on these in depth, uh, we would be here quite a while. And I'd go beyond the what, 8, 10, 8, 15 that, that I was allotted. So let's talk about the guide, the Bible, uh, and believers. Um, it's definitely something that should be part of your daily routine. Um, meditate on it day and night. Hide it in the deepest parts of your heart, your inner self. Uh, memorize it. And when sin presents itself in your life, because it will, because we're sinners that are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8, the word of God will come to mind and you can turn away from that sin. Proverbs chapter 22, actually, Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So in my mind, these two verses kind of, they go hand in hand, they go together, simply because I remember learning them both when I was a child and, uh, and hearing them on Steve Green's Hide Them in Your Heart album. That's really <laughs> where I remember them best from. So definitely a great time to train and encourage the memorization of scripture um, is during childhood, but that doesn't mean uh, that that's the only time. Uh, the scripture and memorization of it, it's a great thing to do throughout your life. And when you need it the most, those verses may pop up in your head and give you direction. So speaking of direction in Psalms, uh, 119 verse 105, the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto 
my path. So it helps you not to stumble and it shows you the direction to move in. I think of being uh, at Camp Horizon and playing a, a night game and it's pitch black outside. There's no moon and you have a flashlight. You're gonna be putting the flashlight at your feet so you can make sure you're not gonna step on anything snakes, whatever it might be, and you're not going to trip over anything. And then at the same time, you're going to show in front of you so you can actually see the direction that you, you want to go. You don't want to end up in the lake. So again, it's, it's, the, it's that guide. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 14 through 17. Let's turn there. Second Timothy chapter three. Verse 14 through 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All the scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that was the Bible in us. So next we're gonna talk about believers and how we should conduct ourselves. So I have a few bees, um, not the insect, um, B-E, and we'll be jumping around the verses. So be patient. So we're gonna be jumping around a little bit. So the first B that I have is be loving. So turn with me to, Titus, which might be on the next page for you. Titus chapter three, and we're gonna read verses one through eight. Titus chapter three, one through eight reads, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humil humility to all men, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceiving, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope eternal life. That is a faith saying, and faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Um, so next let's turn over to 1 John. It's gonna be 1 John chapter four. We're going to read verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> it's a familiar verse. 1 John 4, 7 through 11 reads, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this love... Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And then in Ephesians, there's a theme here and I'll pull it out real quick. But um, in Ephesians, and Chapter 4, 29 through 32, Ephesians chapter 4, 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, and that it may impart to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God. Christ forgave you. Anybody notice, I know there was a lot of reading there, but did anybody notice kind of a pattern that's there? 
And it's a, another familiar verse that will kind of sum it up. Um, so in Titus, we have, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceiving, service, very, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And then we also have, in 1 John we read, at the end, verse 11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Ephesians 4, the end of that one said, Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So despite the fact that we were in a horrible state because of our sin, God still loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And likewise, we're called to show that same love to the others around us. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for that, I mean, what an amazing work um, that while we were still sinners, while we were still his, his enemies, that he would do so something like that for us. So we should, we should be thankful. And so that brings us to be thankful. It's our second B. And we'll jump over to Psalm 100. I think that sums it up pretty well. <clears throat> Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy, mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So our God is a faithful a loving and a merciful God. And that work that he's done for us, despite who we were, uh, shows his amazing love. Um, and we should constantly be thankful uh, for that love and for what he did for us, serve him and, and praise him for saving us from what we truly deserve. So the third B that we're gonna jump into here. So we've gone over two of them so far. So it's be ready. So in Matthew chapter 25 is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. So the gist of the story is there were five that were wise and five that were foolish. The five wise um, virgins were eagerly awaiting the bridegroom and they were ready for however long um, it might take for him to arrive. And the other five were foolish. Uh, they were also waiting for the wedding. The wise ones bring extra oil uh, in their lamps and to keep them burning, but the foolish did not. The bridegroom was delayed um, and the foolish ran out of oil. They asked the wise, hey, can you, can you give us some of that oil that you brought, that extra? And the wise said, no, sorry, uh, then there might not be enough for um, me and you. So they told them, go ahead and go out and buy some. Um, and while the foolish were out trying to buy some of that oil, the bridegroom came. And in the end, the foolish were left outside and when they asked to come into the, the wedding, they, they were refused. So Jesus kind of told, he told this parable to teach about the importance of having that, that oil in our lives, that the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, um, it says, there is a way that seems right to people, but the end thereof is the way of death. So what does that mean? We can go through the motions of living. We can have high morals, we can come to the meetings, we can follow religious practices, we can even say that we're a great person, we're a, we're a fantastic person. And it seems right, but ultimately if we're not lit up with the light of the Holy Spirit, we're still walking around in our own power, and that's not good enough. All have sinned and fallen short um, of God's standard. So in the book of Romans, in chapter three, we see that there is none righteous, no, not one. We need the gift of salvation through the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's, there's no other way. And you shouldn't be putting it off. You don't want to be out looking for oil when, uh, for your lamp when the bridegroom returns. So that's be ready. And uh, the next one, while, while we wait, um, be diligent. So this is another parable in Matthew chapter 25, and it's the parable of the talents. So here we have a parable that the Lord is sharing with his disciples, and there's a man who has three servants, and he 
goes out and he gives the servants a sum of money, talents. And to one, he gives five, another two, and then to one of them, he gives a single talent. And the servants with five and two, they go out, they trade, they, they actually make profit. They double the amount of talents that they were given. And um, when the master's out the last one, he buries his talent in the ground. He doesn't do anything with it out of fear. He kind of just puts it aside. And when the master comes back, I'll just give it right back to him. So when the master returns, he's pleased that the two that had the five and the two talents uh, made profit from the resources that were given to them. And to each of them, he says, well, he says, well done and good and faithful servant. And, but the master was upset with the servant who ended up burying his single talent in the ground out of fear. Uh, the master even mentions that it should have at least been put in the bank to gain some interest. So a couple of takeaways. Um, as believers, we're called to use our resources that the Lord has given us to bring him glory and honor. It might be gifts that we have. Um, it might be singing, speaking, teaching, um, cooking, uh, or monetary resources that we have that we can use for him. Uh, we also have the word of God as a resource and the gospel that we can share uh, with others through our words and through our actions. So here we see that this parable, um, we're encouraged to be diligent, good stewards, and not fearful and lazy, just burying the resources that we've been given underground while we wait for our master's return. In uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 and 24, it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve Christ the Lord. In Proverbs 27, 23, it says, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well unto thy herds. We're called to be diligent and good stewards of what the Lord has given to us. So to recap, Real quick, um, be loving to others just as God loved us. Be thankful for his love and for what he's done for us. Accept his gift of salvation to be ready. And while we wait his, uh, await his return, be diligent. So that is the um, believers. Now let's go on to the church. Let's shift over and see what the Bible has to say about how it's governed under the Lord. So the first topic is the Lord's Supper, and we see the Lord's Supper um, mentioned in, in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 26, we see Paul writing to the church in Corinth where he institutes the Lord's Supper, and he writes, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took a cup after supper, saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant, covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in, in Acts 20, 6 through 7, we see that Luke, um, he mentions that the disciples come together to break bread. and He mentions the first day of the week. So I'm just going to read that really quick. Um, now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Although there isn't a direct commandment to observe the Lord's Supper on a specific day or observe it um, each week, the question we should be asking isn't why do we have the Lord's Supper each week, but why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we remember our Lord as, as often as we gather together? He's done an amazing work and shown us amazing love, despite where we were and who we are. All right, so the next section that we're going to take a look at is the qualifications of elders and deacons. Leadership in the church. So let's talk requirements. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, so I don't really have uh, comments on it, but we'll read it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can speak to the leadership. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
Paul writes, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, overseer or elder, uh, he desires a good work. A uh, bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, meaning not a new believer, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The qualifications of deacons, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So that's leadership. So next we're going to jump over to discipline in the church. We're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, uh, dealing with a sinning brother. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. But if he will not hear, take him to one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see Paul address a case of sexual immorality in the church at Corinth. And uh, the church was not dealing with the sin, and it's, they seemed unconcerned uh, about the behavior. In fact, they were, they were tolerant of what was happening to the point that they seemed proud of it. They thought that by being tolerant of the sin, they were showing love. They knew about the sin. They did nothing about it. And the man that was sinning was not repentant. Paul tells the church to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul then addresses the church and uses an illustration to show how just a little bit of sin can corrupt the whole lot. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 8, Paul says, your glorying is not good. That's in reference to them being proud about their tolerance. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly, you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as we mentioned previously, we should be loving, but there must also be discipline when there is something that goes against God's word. The church in Corinth wasn't disciplining, so Paul had to intervene, correct them, and warn them of what a little sin can do. So I know that this, was, this is a lot, um, and, I, and I feel like I moved very quickly. I moved pretty quickly. Um, and there's a lot more that we could go over, but my hope is that we, we got a little glimpse of why the Bible is our complete guide um, and how it gives us guidance when it comes to our daily lives um, and the church. Thank you. So now let's go ahead and close in prayer real quick and then we'll switch over to our loving God and Father Lord, we thank you so much. For this day that you've given us, we thank you for this time that we have to gather together and learn about your word, Lord. We just uh, pray that you would be with us on our daily lives. We pray that you would help us to, uh, to love one another, Lord, that we would be ready, that we would be diligent. We just pray that you would uh, 
be with the, the leadership of the church, Lord. Pray that you would just guide them and direct them. Um, again, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have together. It's in your name we pray. Amen.